Greetings, folks. Welcome back to my little corner of the library. My original plan for this episode was to start talking about the travels of John Mandeville, written by John Mandeville. Maybe. We think. Probably not. Regardless, sneak peek for next episode. As I started looking more and more into Mandeville, I realized there was, in fact, another story here that I wanted to tell. It's a story that blends books, history, legend, myth, and just a little bit of exotic travel. Now, my name's Dan, you're watching Bookworm History, and today we're going in search of the kingdom of Prester John. Now, it all started in 1145. Christians living in cities in the Holy Land were having a pretty rough time of it. Muslims were making significant gains and threatened to drive the Christians out altogether. On behalf of these beleaguered crusader cities, Bishop Hugh of Jabala was sent to Rome to meet with Pope Eugenius III and argue for a new crusade to relieve the Holy Land. Now, the meeting took place on November 18, 1145, and we have a pretty good idea of what they said and did because the whole thing was recorded by German Bishop Otto of Friesing. As the original tale goes, per Otto, per Hugh, a distant king in the Orient was making his way to the Holy Land to relieve the pilgrims there, and on the way had defeated massive Persian troops. However, the king was currently stuck on the other side of the Tigris River, which had swollen and was impassable. He had been there for several years, waiting to get across the river, and ultimately had decided to return home. The king's name was Presbyter John. Now, if that tale sounds a bit anticlimactic, you're absolutely right, it certainly is. The reason for the tale is unknown, but there are certain theories. Remember that Hugh was arguing for a new crusade, assuming that this was not the first time Europeans had heard of such a king, Hugh could have been arguing against his involvement. If such a king were going to come to the aid of the Holy Land, then there would be no need for Rome to send such troops. But if the story went that the king had gotten stuck on the other side of the Tigris River and was unable to make it, Rome would need to gather troops for a new crusade. Hugh must have argued his case fairly well, because on December 1st, 1145, a new papal bull was issued to launch a new crusade. It failed miserably. The Holy Land might as well have been waiting for a mythical king to cross a river. Now, Otto's tale was the first written reference of a Prester John, or a Presbyter John. If Hugh was telling his story to the Pope to gather support for a new crusade, then it's entirely possible, in fact probable, that the tale had already been around. Hugh's story, as it's written down in Otto's book, is a blending of fact and fiction. Now, there were Christians in the Far East. They were of a sect known as Nestorians, and had supposedly descended spiritually from St. Thomas. Yes, the doubting one. Who, following the resurrection, according to uh, the apocryphal Acts of St. Thomas, made his way to India, where he set up a Christian practice. As for the name itself, Prester John, or Presbyter John. Now, the word Prester means priest. It's derived from the Latin Presbyter, which derives from the Greek Presbyteros, which means elder or old man. Now, John the Apostle, in his second and third epistles, refers to himself as elder. In the original, it's Presbyteros. Thus, he is calling himself Prester John. Possibly the origin for the name? Possibly not, but it seems an odd coincidence. Two 12th century sources also tell of a Patriarch John, a king in India who had actually visited Rome with the intention of meeting with the Pope. So we have distant Indian kings, we have Christians in India, and we have possible etymology for the name Prester itself. Whether all of this was combined into the original tale that Hugh told to the Pope, we don't really know, but it seems to be an interesting coincidence. The story would spread over Europe for the next few years and become increasingly popular, but ultimately people regarded it as clever fiction. At least until 1165, when Prester John himself wrote a letter. The letter was written from Prester John to Emperor Manuel Comnenus of the Byzantine Empire and stated that Prester John was lord and ruler of the three Indias, near, middle, and far. He says that he is ruler of a land so vast that 72 kings pay tribute to him, and it overflows with gold, jewels, spices, milk, and honey, that there is in fact a river of stones that flows like water, and an ocean of sand that is unpassable except for four days a year, allowing people to pass to the shrine of St. Thomas at a mountain beyond it. It's a veritable paradise, in fact bordering on paradise. Supposedly, the eastern border of Prester John's kingdom is the Garden of Eden itself. Now, the letter was supposedly written in Arabic, translated to Greek, translated to Latin, and from there translated into just about every European language. However, to actually read the content of the letter, and looking at the earliest drafts we have, it seems that it was just originally written in Latin. 
What this goes to suggest is that it was not a correspondence from a distant king in India, but rather a clever fabrication from a monk in the Western world. Who actually wrote it? We may never know. Why did they write it? We may never know. There's a lot of unanswered questions in the story of Prester John, but why the Prester John letter was written is interesting. It could have been as a morale boost to Europeans who were still smarting from their losses in the Holy Land. It could have been a clever fabrication, just literature. It could have just been written as a hoax. Regardless of the who, the how, the why, or any other question you could pose, the Prester John letter spread like wildfire. Translated into every language in Europe, and every time it was, it would become more and more elaborate. Now, learned men perhaps knew that it was a fabrication. The letter didn't follow the form that regal correspondence was supposed to in those days. However, the public ate it up. We fast forward to the early 13th century, when word reaches Europe that there's a powerful monarch conquering all of Asia, and in fact attempting to conquer all of the known world. He has defeated Muslim and Persian troops, and is slowly making his way to the west. Could this be, they wonder? Could this be the Prester John of myth that legend has told us will come to the aid of the Holy Land and free the Christians from the Muslim rule? As if that wasn't enough, word reaches Europe that this king wishes to accept emissaries from Western nations. All of Europe was suddenly in a tizzy. They sent emissaries east as fast as they could. They wanted to form an alliance with this king, sweeping through the Holy Land and making the entire world safe for Christendom. The ruler's name, of course, was Genghis Khan. And not only was he not a Christian, but he had absolutely no interest in forming an alliance with Western nations. The reason that he wanted emissaries sent to him was to submit, not to form an alliance. Over the next 300 years, travelers in the East would slowly realize that Genghis Khan was not, in fact, the Prester John of legend of which they'd been told. Rather than being Prester John, he was, in fact, the conqueror of Prester John. So Prester John must be somewhere else in Asia. But as people would travel more and more, the edges of the map would slowly fill in, and they would realize that Prester John was not there. But the story had deep roots, and people were convinced of the existence of this distant Christian king. When the letter from Prester John was first written in 1165, it said that he ruled over all three Indias, near, middle, and far. And at the turn of the 13th century, people in Europe really only had a fuzzy idea of exactly where India was. As people would discover more and more about Asia and finally come to the realization that Prester John wasn't there, they did not abandon the story. Rather, they just assumed they had been looking on the wrong continent. In 1497, Portuguese explorer Vasco da Gama had set out, sailing from Portugal south, then east, then north, and then east again. He would return to Portugal in 1499, having discovered a sea route to India far more profitable and quick than the land routes they had previously been working with. As the Portuguese empire became more and more powerful, they began to colonize more and more of the Indian coast. The only problem was the Red Sea, an area they could never quite seem to subjugate. Through repeated attempts at conquering the area around the Red Sea, they reached out to locals, trying to recruit powerful monarchs to their cause. They came to discover that in Ethiopia, there was, in fact, a powerful Christian king. He was wealthy, he ruled over vast territories of land, and he was a Christian. All of this seemed to suggest that they had finally, at long last, found the Prester John of legend. The fact that it was 300 years after the first letter had been written was no never mind to them. Two stories then evolved out of this. Either the Ethiopian king was the descendant of Prester John, and Prester John was merely a title that was passed down from generation to generation, or, as was written in one translation of the letter of Prester John, this Ethiopian king was the original article, the real deal, having simply drunk from the fountain of youth and become immortal. The Ethiopians were more than welcoming to the Portuguese. They also wanted an alliance to suppress some rebels that they were having trouble with in the southwest corner of the country. They also wanted to open up trade relations. The Portuguese kept referring to the Ethiopian monarch as Prester John, completely unable to let the story go. The Ethiopians, still wanting to trade and form an alliance with the Portuguese, simply let it slide, although secretly they had absolutely no idea why they kept calling their king Prester John. The age of exploration would wear on, and ultimately even Ethiopia and Africa would become mapped. Finally, Europeans had to let the tale of Prester John go realizing that he wasn't out there and probably had never been. Though the tale was romantic and perhaps spurred the common man to go and explore and seek new lands, the tale became relegated to the land of myth, and the realm of Prester John would join other mythical realms, such as Atlantis, El Dorado, or Avalon. Now, as with all of our other episodes, we've barely scratched the surface of the Prester John story. There is 
so much more to this tale than I could sum up in a 10 minute YouTube video, and I would highly recommend you uh, to look into it on your own. It's, it's just, it's a fascinating tale, and it's one that's largely forgotten, overshadowed by things like Atlantis or El Dorado in the public consciousness. If you're looking for more information, uh, the book The Realm of Prester John by Robert Silverberg is a very, very detailed, very thoroughly researched book. Uh, it's where most of the information for this episode came from, along with uh, The Fourth Part of the World by Toby Lester. Uh, it's a general summary of the Age of Exploration, uh, centering primarily on the Waldseemuller map, the Universalis, uh, the Cosmographia Universalis. Well, that's all we've got for you today. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, be sure to click that like button down below, give us a big thumbs up. Be sure to hit the subscribe button on your way out so you stay up to date on all of our latest videos. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks for stopping by.